All right, so every now and then I come across a bit of filmmaking so baffling that it just gets stuck in my craw for days. Like, the editing for Suicide Squad did that. And earlier this week, I rewatched Rent for the first time in a decade, and oh boy, do I have a thing for you. Now, to be clear, I'm going to be talking about the craft of filmmaking, the specific art of telling a visual story, so editing, blocking, and cinematography. Rent has many problems, but the movie's been out for 12 years and the musical has been around for 20, so it's a pretty well-trod path to point out that Maureen is emotionally abusive and gaslights her girlfriend Joanne, that Mark is a misery tourist who refuses to use his relative privilege to help his marginalized friends, that Mark is an awful artist who exemplifies the worst habits of lazy artists, that Benny is making fairly sensible decisions but rightful criticisms of gentrification are absent in favor of calling him a sellout, that Mark quits an incredibly well-paying part-time job just so we can finish cutting together his home movie, which just... What? From here on in, I shoot without a script. That the story commodifies the HIV epidemic as window dressing to give the characters the pathos of a death sentence rather than say anything cogent or meaningful about the way that society reacted to HIV and AIDS in the 80s and that Mark's principal concern for the homeless stems from his belief in the transitive artistic properties of suffering, thus living next to homeless people makes him and his art more authentic and real by extension. So we're going to acknowledge that all of those criticisms exist and instead focus on one specific scene and the deeply confusing filmmaking choices made in the framing of that scene. Okay, context for the uninitiated. Rent is a 1996 musical set in 1989-1990 New York against a backdrop of urban decay and the rampaging HIV crisis. In 2005, the stage musical was adapted for screen with Chris Columbus, yes, the Home Alone guy, directing. The story follows an ensemble of characters, most of whom are HIV positive, through a pivotal year in their lives. In the scene that we're concerned about, Mimi, a 19-year-old stripper and heroin addict, played here by Rosario Dawson, has just gotten off work and is looking to party, so she heads upstairs to the apartment of Roger, a mid-twenties unemployed musician and HIV-positive recovering heroin addict. Oh, also, Roger is still recovering from the death of his girlfriend, who killed herself when she found out she was HIV-positive, so he's got a bit of damage that he's working through. Mimi comes in, ready to bone, and pulls out her heroin. Roger doesn't take this well, tells her to get out, they back and forth, he kicks her out, and then... <sighs> then we get to the resolution of the scene, and just... Okay, so in the song that they're singing, Mimi is saying that she's, she's super free and awesome because she lives every day like it's her last 100% in the present and like she argues that this is totally awesome and the best so they should totally shoot up and bone. Oh, she's HIV positive too, but we as the audience don't know that yet and the characters don't know this about each other and they don't tell each other until later because it's a big, it's a big reveal thing. Oh. Anyway, she's arguing the hedonist perspective. Embracing indulgent self-destruction is what Roger needs to get out of his existential crisis. Roger's side of the argument is more tempered and, well, a little bit more mature. If you're so wise, then tell me, what do you need, smack? His point and the title of the song, Another Day, comes from Roger's admonition that she should prove she actually cares about his personal demons by coming back another day and not bringing heroin this time. He's actually really firm with that one. Leave the heroin behind. I keep mentioning the heroin because I don't want you to forget it. It's a pretty pivotal element to the conversation and to Roger's whole motivation, since, you know, he can pretty much draw a direct line between his former heroin use and his dead girlfriend and really almost everything that's awful about his life. Also, I don't want you to forget it because the movie immediately forgets that these characters are talking about heroin. The setup for the song's finale is that Roger has kicked Mimi out, she's gone down to the street, so immediately we're setting up symbolic levels. Roger is in a position of power, a position of perspective, literally the higher ground, while Mimi is literally standing in the gutter. So far we're fine, it's a little blunt, but whatever. But then here's where it goes weird. Everything else about the blocking, the lighting, the framing, all of it, biases in favor of Mimi. Roger is in shadows and darkness, and the bars of the fence are like a cage, 
It's very student's guide to symbolism. Meanwhile, Mimi is bathed in angelic light, and the rest of Roger's friends all walk in down at street level and join Mimi in imploring Roger to give up his perspective and just live like he's about to die, all four of them repeating the line, no day but today, over and over, no day but today, no day but today. Oh sure, Roger has a higher ground, but look how sad and lonely and conflicted he is up there. Come on, Roger, climb on down here to the gutter, join your friends who are totally right and correct and the ones you, audience, should be cheering for. Empathize with Mimi. Roger is clearly the unreasonable one in this conversation. Oh, poor Mimi, did mean old Roger not want to do heroin with you? Shame on him for not coping with his trauma on a timetable that was convenient for you. What's the message here supposed to be? Okay, so I get that there's this undercurrent of trying to get Roger to open up a little bit, find some human contact, but the framing of that is still really important. Mimi isn't trying to coax Roger into going for a walk in the rain. She wants him to shoot heroin and have sex with her. Intent isn't the only thing that matters. It's kind of important how you ask. And the thing is that the visual dimension is so powerful that it will basically overwhelm any other consideration. The show doesn't just present a philosophical argument between living for the day and living for tomorrow, and then leave it to the audience to sort out if they agree with Mimi or Roger. The show makes a judgment. The show picks a side, and that side is, pretty unambiguously, Mimi's side. Roger is given the higher ground, but he's also, as mentioned already, caged by the fence and framed in relative darkness, or at the very least shadows lit with a reverse key. The chosen angle is also rather severe. This combined with the facial acting places Roger less in a position of power and more in a position of isolation. Mimi, however, is out in the open. The camera is down at personal level. So while Roger's angle reflects Mimi's point of view that she would be looking up at him, Mimi's angle doesn't reflect Roger's. This isn't a straightforward reverse where we're seeing each character through the other's eyes. Instead, the camera positions us as the audience down on the street with Mimi. The camera is our surrogate in the world of the film, and we are placed with Mimi. To finalize this, at the end of the song, at the end of the argument, we end the scene with Angel comforting Mimi. That is the consequence that we're shown. We get to see the emotional fallout of this argument from Mimi's perspective. That she's hurt, that she feels rejected, and that Angel, another sympathetic character, comforts her. We are shown this to the exclusion of seeing the impact on Roger. Now, we can probably infer that Roger went back inside and sulked a bit, that this whole thing put a wet towel on his night, but inference is dramatically inferior to being shown, especially when it comes to building resonance in the audience, building empathy and getting the audience to invest in the emotional state of a character. Stories, movies in particular, are ultimately quite morally simplistic. Unless they go out of their way to build nuance and ambiguity into every aspect of their storytelling, they almost always come out in terms of right and wrong. Because the camera introduces so much inherent bias that it's overwhelming, and that's what happens here. The film is telling us that Mimi is right and Roger is wrong. But again, Mimi isn't just talking about coaxing Roger out of his shell. This isn't just about his unwillingness to open up to her emotionally and allow himself to feel vulnerable. It is about those things. That is a part of the message here, but it is more specifically about doing heroin and having sex with her. Dr. Mimi sees his pain and the cure she's got is sweet, sweet drugs and getting his dick wet. So yeah, there's that. Rant, I tell ya.